you're up. Yate, CEO, hello, and a warm welcome to the 18th speaker series, A Sense of Place, <laughs> Indigenous Perspectives of Land, Water, and Sky. Today, we are very honored to host Commander Nicole Mann, the first Native American woman in space. This series is hosted by the Indigenous Education Institute. Today's session is supported and funded by NASA HEAT, the Heliophysics Educational Activation Team, <clears throat> led by Dr. Michael Kirk and the NASA American Indian Alaska Native Working Group, led by Daniela Scalise. My name is Dr. Nancy Maryboy. I am Diné and Saligi. Navajo and Cherokee. My Cherokee name is Tsawayuga, and I am from the Cherokee Bird Clan. I'm also of the clans of the Diné, Bibatoni, the Deer Springs Clan, and Senjakini, the Cliff Dweller Clan. I'm the pre founding president and executive director of the Indigenous Education Institute, which has been in existence for more than 27 years. We're located in the San Juan Islands Washington State and on the Navajo Nation. I would like to begin today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of our Mother Earth to honor our many participants from around the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, as well as the pandemic of COVID-19, we wish to honor all indigenous people from around the world. I also want to acknowledge that I currently reside on the ancestral lands of the saltwater salmon people of the Salish Sea, who have called this place home since time immemorial. I honor the inherent and acquired treaty rights of these indigenous peoples. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional indigenous thinking and living. In our native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting dynamic worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. An additional focus for the speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding of cultural difference and to support successful and diverse working relationships, whether it be in education, health, national resource management, astronomy, NASA, museums, science centers, and tribal communities. I want to personally thank you for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is heartwarming. We have over 600 people registered today from all across the United States. And we have participants from around the world, including many from Canada and others from Austria, Japan, Afghanistan, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and New Zealand. It is also interesting and heartwarming for me that we have more than 160 different tribes represented in our registrations for this presentation today. We also have many classrooms that have registered for this event. I want to give a particular shout out to all the students and staff of the Little Singer Community School, an all Navajo school on the Navajo Reservation, who are very excited to hear from Commander Mann. This webinar today is hosted jointly by me in my role as a member of NASA HEAT and by Daniela Scalise from NASA. It has been a great pleasure to work with you, Danielle, over the years, and I'm especially excited bringing this webinar into fruition. Daniela, would you like to speak a few words of welcome? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And just wanted to say a big thank you to you, Nancy. Uh, for the opportunity to collaborate with you on this. You've been a role model and a matriarch for me in the work I've been doing with Indigenous communities for the past two decades. 
what a joy it's been to come together with you to bring this moment in time, this amazing opportunity to be with you, Commander Man, to the communities we've both been working with. And I'd also like to thank Heidi Lavelle from the NASA Astronaut Office at Johnson Space Center for all she's done to make today happen. So thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you, Daniela. And um, I want to give a shout out to Heidi, too, because she's been wonderful. And I'm so excited to see Nicole Mann on the screen. This is like a dream. Um, before we continue, I'd like to ask you to put any questions for the presenter into the question and answer box, not into the chat box. The chat box is just for chatting. So um, you can put anything you want in the chat box. And our um, our NASA interns are going to be asking questions of Commander Mann at the end of her presentation. I would now like to introduce Commander Nicole Mann. And Mann, does she have an amazing biography? Um, she was born in Petaluma, California. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the U US Naval Academy and a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering with a specialty in fluid mechanics from Stanford University. That's my alma mater. She's a colonel in the Marine Corps and served as a combat fighter pilot and test pilot in the FA-18 Hornet and the Super Hornet. In 2009, she graduated in class 135 from the US Naval Test Pilot School in Maryland. Colonel Nicole Mann was selected into NASA's Astronaut Corps in June 2013. She launched to the International Space Station, ISS, as commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-5 mission aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft Endurance on October 5th, 2022. The Crew-5 astronauts lived and worked aboard the ISS for ne nearly six months. During their mission, Crew-5 contributed to hundreds of experiments and technology demonstrations, including cardiovascular health, bioprinting, and fluid behavior in microgravity to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and to benefit life on Earth. The Inter International Crew of Four spent 157 days in orbit. Commander Mann conducted two spacewalks, totaling 14 hours and two minutes. She has accumulated more than 2,700 2, flight hours in 25 types of aircraft, 200 carrier arrested landings, and 47 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And now at this time, I would like to give the mic and give a very warm welcome to Commander Nicole Mann. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you today and to share my journey and my experience and to share a little piece of what it's like to live and work outside of our planet. Um, so I'd like to start with just a little bit of a presentation um, to answer maybe some of the questions of how did I go from being a little girl growing up in Northern California to living and working on board the International Space Station. So as mentioned, I was born in Petaluma, California, and here's a picture of California of the valley taken from space from the International Space Station, and you're looking south along the valley. So you can see the clouds and the, maybe you can uh, pick up San Francisco Bay there. And so I grew up just north of that. And uh, I'm Wailaki from uh, Kovalo, part of the Round Valley Indian tribes, which is just about two and a half hours north of where I grew up. Uh, and growing up in this area, I loved it. It was beautiful, the ocean and the mountains and a lot of outdoor activity. And to be honest, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I knew pretty early on that I wanted to serve in the military. There was a strong sense of honor and duty that I had as a young child uh, that I knew I wanted to serve my country. I also knew that it was important to get a great education because that would open up future doors in my life. So I started looking at the different service academies and came upon the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. 
I also played soccer as a child growing up and wanted to play soccer in college. So that was kind of the third piece of the puzzle for me. I could serve in the military, I could play soccer, and I could get a great education at the Naval Academy. So off I left after graduating high school all the way to the other side of the country. And I loved Annapolis. It was absolutely incredible. I studied mechanical engineering, was fortunate enough to play soccer. And during the summers, you get to train with different aspects of the military, the Navy and the Marine Corps. And I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a Marine. It was just a different sense of honor and tradition that really drew me towards the Marine Corps. But I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in the Marine Corps. The summer before my senior year, I got a ride in the back seat of an F-A-18. That's a Hornet, which if you've seen the Blue Angels fly before, that's the same jet that the Blue Angels fly. And that's the first time I realized, wait a minute, I can be a fighter pilot and a Marine? Absolutely, this sounds like the best of both worlds for me. So I went to flight school and the basic school and learned to fly F-18s. I did two deployments off the aircraft carrier into Iraq and Afghanistan. It was an incredible experience working with a very diverse group of people, not only operating in and around the aircraft carrier, but also supporting our troops on the ground. And then I was up for my next set of orders. I really missed the engineering side of the world, but I still wanted to be a fighter pilot. And that's where I started looking at test pilot school. Uh, there, it seemed like I could combine both of those aspects of engineering and being a fighter pilot. Now, mind you, at this point, I really hadn't given much thought to becoming an astronaut. Uh, I think as a kid growing up and during the early years of my service, it seemed like something, I guess something that other people did. I had never met an astronaut. Of course, it seemed incredible, but for some reason, I just didn't see that as a possibility for myself, and I never uh, put a lot of consideration to that. Well, that all changed when I went to test pilot school. There I had a great opportunity to fly many different types of aircraft, work with international partners throughout the world, and I had a chance to visit NASA for the first time. NASA was an incredible place where you saw engineers and operators and pilots and astronauts working together, working towards a mission that was something so much bigger than each of ourselves, working on human exploration, science and technology development, not only to benefit exploration into deep space, but also to benefit humans back here on Earth. And I really wanted to be a part of that team. Uh, fortunately, NASA opened up the window for applications and I applied. I was selected in 2013 as part of eight astronauts uh, to come down to NASA to start training. And you can see we have quite a diverse group of people in my class, both men and women from all different types of background, those that served in the military or continue to serve in the military that are aviators, but some that are doctors or flight test engineers. Um, we also have an electrical engineer and a marine biologist. And so my path uh, is just one path to becoming an astronaut. I went the military test pilot route, but there's plenty of other opportunities and ways um, that people become astronauts. There's a whole other piece of, of life other than just work, though. There's your personal life and your family life. Well, fortunately, I um, married a great man named Travis, and we have one son. He's 12 years old now, and so our whole family moved down to Houston. And in fact, my son was only one and a half when we moved down to Houston. And it's uh, just like everything in life. It is a constant work to try to find that balance between family life and work life. But I really point that out because I think when I was younger, I felt like I was gonna have to choose between maybe a career and having a family. And I realized that you don't have to make that choice. You can, you can do both, you can have both. You just need to build a strong support network that surrounds you. So after many years of training, I was assigned to a mission to be the commander of a Crew-5, which is a SpaceX spacecraft. And our destination was the International Space Station. And NASA helped me put together a video to talk about some of the highlights of that mission that I'd like to share with you now.
And there they are. The astronauts of Crew 5 taking their first steps outside as they head to the pad. There they go. The rocket recline. <laughs> there it is. I, I like the way they did it kind of in coordination. And here we go, the first two astronauts to board Crew Dragon. On the left, Josh Cassida, and on the right, Commander Nicole Mann. And here come our second two astronauts, Mission Specialists Koichi Wakata and Ana Kikana. Special thanks on behalf of all the crew to our family and friends. It is your love and support that help make dreams come true. Now let's do this. Crew 5 displays are configured for launch. Separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. And there is separation. Dragon separation confirmed. On crew five, call this little guy our free fall indicator. We're here to tell you there's plenty of gravity up here. In fact, that's what's keeping us in orbit right now. The moon in the farthest portion of your screen there, the furthest back circle, Dragon in the middle, and the International Space Station in the closest field of view, of course, with our pale blue dot underneath. on the big loop contact and soft capture complete attenuation in progress here we come through first one through the hatch is going to be nicole mann commander of dragon next one through the hatch is josh cassida the pilot of dragon koichi wakata of jaxa coming through the hatch and last but not least on a kicking up rocks cosmos just entered the International Space Station. So now that we were finally on board, it was time for our crew to get to work. Uh, the space station is an incredible floating microgravitory, microgravity laboratory. And a lot of the science that we do is on ourself. So you can see that I'm riding a bike here, uh, but there's no seat, just pedals, because there's no gravity, so I don't need a seat. But we're looking to see how microgravity affects our cardiovascular system. And here, Koichi is looking to see how space affects you cognitively. Of course, keeping the astronauts safe is a big part of our mission, and we, so we do a lot of scientific research on my great radiation. So these guys are super cool. We grew these plants in space. Not only did we grow them, but then we harvested the seeds and sent those seeds back down to Earth. The next experiments will be the seeds from space and new seeds, and we'll fly them up to space to see the epigenetic changes of these plants. Some of what we do is technology development. These little guys here are called Astro Bee, the little flying robots that can navigate off each other and navigate within the module. The future of human exploration will be robots and humans working together on the space station and eventually the surface of the moon. Now, as we look at going farther into deep space, we have to figure out ways to keep the astronauts healthy from a nutrition perspective. So these are different types of yeast and yogurt that we're cultivating in space to see what works and how we could supplement an astronaut's diet beyond just the freeze-dried food and the thermal stabilized food that we already have. We also grew tomatoes in space. So these are little dwarf tomatoes, and I can't tell you how incredible they were, not only to see something grow in space, but when you pull down these little bellows, these, this plastic sleeve, you can smell the leaves, and it gives you this incredible connection back to our home planet. This is one of my favorite. It's called the Biofabrication Facility, or BFF. We are literally 3D printing human cells in space. 
Now we can do that in space and much higher quality than we can on Earth because in space there's no gravity gradients, so no density gradients, no thermal gradients. And these high quality cells can be printed. In fact, this past summer we printed a human meniscus. While we were on board, we did five spacewalks. Here's the robotic arm and that helps us during a spacewalk and also to capture visiting vehicles. You can see that part there connected to the space station, we call that the shoulder. The elbow is out there in free space, and the wrist is the part that's flying around. And so we fly the robotic arm, you can fly it from ground and also from inside the space station. The first series of spacewalks were done by Josh and Koichi, and here you can see them coming out of the airlock. Now, their mission was to install upgraded solar rays for the space station. You can see Josh here. He's connected, his feet are connected to the robotic arm. And I'm inside with Koichi, and I'm flying that robotic arm around. Now, Josh is holding onto a new solar array. Although it weighs about 780 pounds on Earth, it weighs nothing in space, but it still has mass. So it still has a ton of momentum. And you have to be very precise and careful when flying Josh around while he's holding on to the new solar array. Here, Josh and Frank are rolling out the new solar array. And you can see there's the legacy solar array there in the background. The new array is much smaller than the old array, but it provides 30% more power to the space station. Next, it was time for Kuichi and I to go out the door. Our mission was to install a support structure for the next solar arrays coming up the following summer. Once we come out of the airlock, I want you to notice how many tethers I have in front of me and how they float around. Now, everything needs to be tethered down. If it's not, it will float away into the vacuum of space. That includes yourself, your bags, your tools, every single thing that you have. Here you can see I'm translating or climbing along the truss of the space station, and I have this bag with a support structure. That weighs about 250 pounds, and you can see the momentum of it is swinging around quite a bit on my side. So you have to move very slowly and deliberately. Kuichi and I here are working together to put uh, the upper triangle of this support structure together. Now, unfortunately, when we went to install it, we ran into some mechanical interference with one of the struts on the space station. But it was a great example of how the people on the ground supported us in space, and we came up with troubleshooting techniques to overcome these challenges. Here you can see I have my feet in what's called an APFR in front of the legacy solar array. And here Koichi has a pliers and we finally got this strut installed. Just such a cool example of everybody working together to make the mission successful, even though we came upon some challenges that threatened our mission. So after we were done with our two spacewalks, it was time for us to uh, come back in the door. It was absolutely one of the most incredible experiences that I've ever had. Now, following those spacewalks, we actually had a major problem on board the space station. This is a Soyuz spacecraft, which is uh, flown by Russia, and it flew up two cosmonauts and one American astronaut. It was hit by a micrometeorite, and you can see the external cooling loop is being ejected into the vacuum of space. Now, because of that, we didn't have confidence that the spacecraft would keep the astronauts safe. So we took this seat liner from the Soyuz spacecraft, and we installed it into my spacecraft, Dragon. We removed struts and cargo pallets that were never meant to be removed, and we put that seat liner in there so that if we have a problem on space station, we could take our American astronaut, Frank, strap him down, and get him home safely. Now, there's a ton of maintenance on the board the space station. Some of it is planned maintenance or upgrades, but guess what? If the trouble breaks, if the toilet breaks like it did right here, you are the plumber on board. Not only are you the plumber, but you're also the electrician and the IT person. Um, but often we're working together with teams on the ground. So this is a four bed CO2 scrubber. So it scrubs uh, the air to make it safe for astronauts to breathe. And Koichi and I are doing some upgrades here on this scrubber. And that's what I'm giving a thumbs up and waving to is the team on the ground that's helping me walk through that process. Sometimes you have failures like Josh and I experienced here. We're in the air airlock working on our spacesuit. That little component that Josh is holding is a fan pump separator. And it's a vital component to the life support system of our spacesuit space when we go out on a spacewalk. 
it was never intended to be worked on. So it was an incredible effort, again, of the engineers and the team on the ground working together with the astronauts in space to make the mission successful. Now, when you're on board for six months, you need a lot of supplies. So we have visiting vehicles or cargo spacecraft that come visit us. We had two. This one is uh, north of Grumman. It's called uh, Cygnus or NG-18, and it was the SS Sally Ride. You can see that this uh, solar arrays, which are the circular pieces there on the spacecraft, that one on the right side of the screen didn't fully deploy. In fact, we almost lost the mission because they didn't have the proper power. And now you can see the robotic arm coming out, the end of it, the wrist, and we are capturing this spacecraft. And so I'm flying that robotic arm from inside the cupola. Once we have the spacecraft captured, then the ground controls the robotic arm and they berth it to the space station. This is the team of Northrop Grumman who worked so hard to save that mission. Unfortunately, they had to shut down some of the uh, powered components on board the spacecraft, but was still successful in getting to station. Here's another type of cargo spacecraft, but this one is SpaceX, and it's totally automated. So it flies to the International Space Station, comes in, and docks itself. Now, I have monitors on board, and if something looks bad, I can send that spacecraft away. But other than that, we're just monitoring. Once the spacecraft are attached, we open the hatches, and it's really all hands on deck to get all the cargo, all the science, the supplies, the food, everything we need on board. Now, living and working in space is awesome. We work out about two and a half hours every day. This is ARED. It uses vacuum tubes to provide resistance so we can train our muscles. This is the treadmill. And you really, you're just bungeed to the side of the wall. You wear a harness like a backpack to keep you down. Eating and food is a lot of fun. I always tell kids, this is the one place where you're allowed to play with your food. Now, this is just Cheerios and it comes with a powdered milk. So you add some water and uh, let it rehydrate. And you can see because of the surface tension of the liquid, it just sticks to my spoon and you kind of eat it like normal. As far as drinking goes, we have these bags that you fill with water and you could drink out of the straw that you can see in my hand there. Uh, but sometimes it's fun just to squirt a blob of water into space and you can always drink that way. Often we eat together, which is helpful because you, here you can see I'm opening up this little bag of chocolates and when you open it up, everything will just fly away in every direction. And so often the crew eat together and if something kind of floats over towards me, I can kind of just bat it away back at you and help each other keep track of all of our food. Um, and so it's also an important time that we come together to share a meal, to talk about the day, maybe discuss any issues or problems that we had and share advice with each other. Our tortillas in space are awesome. You can stick anything to our tortilla and it works great. This is beans and rice and meat, and you can rack those up. Uh, my sister sent the fixings for a charcuterie board for me, and I used honey to try to keep everything down on the cutting board, but they still kind of floated away. And of course, we celebrate uh, many of the holidays together as a crew in space. So although that we're working really hard, it's really important that you still take that time to come together to relax and enjoy each other's company. People often ask me about sleeping. We have four sleep stations on the left, right, on the bottom and overhead. And my sleep station was overhead. You can see it's the size of kind of like a large telephone booth. And this blue bag is my sleeping bag. I put one bungee around my waist and the bag is tied to the wall and I just zip myself up. It's quite comfortable. Physics in space is super cool. This is just water. And again, you can see that surface tension of the water at work here. This water is just sticking to my hand. It's kind of like a goo or something. It feels like my hands are submerged in a bucket of water, but you can see it's just a very thin film. So we decided to squirt a huge ball of water into the uh, middle of a module, and we put some food coloring inside to see what would happen. Then we added an alka seltzer so we could see the bubbles form. And you can see as the bubbles form, some little pieces of water will get ejected from this sphere. Then we thought it was a good idea to smash my face into that ball of water to see what would happen. And you can see just like my hands, that water sticks to my face and makes a thin film. Now I forgot I put the Alka-Seltzer in that bubble. So those bubbles went right up my nose. It didn't feel very good. Oh, here's conservation of angular momentum. So this is just a regular drill that we put a handle on. And you can see Josh there on the bottom and he's spinning the drill and I'm just holding on on top. When I let go, I continue to spin. Here you can see Koichi clearly has much more mass than I do as he is barely spinning and I continue to spin quite quickly. 
And yes, it's true. You can definitely get yourself dizzy in space when you spin around too much. But you can see until something touches me or I touch something, I will continue to rotate like that. Uh, here's conservation of linear momentum. This is a jug of water. You can see it has a much more mass than I have. Uh, so here, Josh hooked his feet on a handrail. And he decided, we're going to chuck this jug at me and see what happens. And you can see it's quite powerful. We had a lot of fun making videos uh, in space. A lot of times this is for educational programs or school children to demonstrate these basic laws of physics. You can see just like an ice skater, when my arms come out, I almost stop. And then the second I bring my arms back in, I continue to spin quite rapidly. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to make some of these educational videos while we were up there. Oh, Koichi, Koichi's from Japan and he loves baseball in space. You can play baseball all by yourself. So you can be the pitcher. And if you're fast enough, then you can also be the batter. Uh -huh. And if you're really good like Koichi is, you can even get yourself out. <laughs> so we had, we had some fun uh, playing and just living there in microgravity. Uh, one of the most incredible places on the space station is the cupola. Now, the cupola is a module that has seven windows. It's on the belly of the space station, which normally faces planet Earth. Here's a picture from outside, uh, from the Russian segment, looking at the cupola. Here I am in node three. I'm going to bring you down into the cupola so you can see what our beautiful planet looks like from low Earth orbit. Now, the cupola is uh, not only an incredible view of our planet, but it's used for Earth observation. So uh, video and photographs of a climate change, of weather patterns, of volcanoes erupting. And um, on board the space station, we're 250 miles above the planet, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. That means we make one lap around the planet every 90 minutes. So for the astronauts on board, that is a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. It's one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen. Now you can see our planet and during the daytime, you can't see any stars because our planet is so bright. But at night, you can see more stars than you can ever imagine. And here is the sun rising as we rotate into our view. Uh, this is passing over Africa. And so entire continents you'll pass over in just a matter of minutes. And at night, when you could see all those stars and the empty vacuum of space, and as you bring your eyes down, you see that thin line there that's outside of the planet? That's our Earth's atmosphere. And that is the only thing that's keeping all humans alive on Earth from the vacuum of space. So it was an incredible view and mixed emotions. Really, you see our planet, it's so beautiful and powerful in all of its majesty. But then you look in the vacuum of space and you see the fragility of our planet as well. And here's the beautiful northern lights. We took time lapse, lapse photography, capturing the dynamic colors we go. of the lights. Inside node two, looking at the hatchway, we can see all four of our crew members actually suited up and ready to go. All hooks open. All hooks open. Depart burn one. Luke and crew five, magnificent sunset departure. You guys look great. Great job up here. We're gonna miss you. Godspeed. Uh, obviously that beautiful bright light in the middle, that's Crew Dragon Endurance coming home after 157 days in space. Main shoot descent rate nominal. And as you just saw, splashdown of Crew 5. Six Dragon splashdown, mains have been released. Dragon, brace for capsule lift. There it is, side hatch open. Dragon Endurance, on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home. So it was absolutely an incredible mission. And now that I'm back on Earth, I'm supporting the current missions on board the space station. We have a crew of seven up there right now, um, living and executing all the science and technology development on board. 
And as far as what's next, I'm not exactly sure, but there's so much going on and so much to be involved in. Not only in low Earth orbit, where we are supporting the International Space Station, but you're also seeing commercial industry in low Earth orbit. We actually have the launch of the first uh, crewed flight, crew flight test of the Starliner, which is a new Boeing spacecraft, and that's going to launch uh, next Monday on May 6th. That'll be the first time that people have launched on board and its destination is the International Space Station. So then we'll have three different spacecraft attached to the space station. And NASA is also focusing our efforts beyond low Earth orbit back towards the moon as part of the Artemis program. And that will be a series of missions. Uh, first, flying our Orion spacecraft around the moon to test out the life support systems of Orion. And that mission is called Artemis II. Subsequent missions will be landing on the moon and eventually docking to a, a what's called Gateway, which is like a space station, but much smaller, and it's in the cislunar space. And really, we're looking at these missions as development, as stepping stones to explore deeper into space, uh, eventually to Mars. And so there's so much opportunity, not only in the government, but in the private industry, uh, working with our international partners uh, for the exploration of space. And with that, I think uh, we have some time to take some questions. Hi, yes. I'm trying to unmute myself. Good. Um, all right, I want to um, turn over the mic to Chanel and Caitlin, who are NASA um, wonderful NASA interns, and um, they are going to. Um, um, ask you a few questions. So, um, Chanel, Sounds good. go ahead, take it away. <laughs> a question from Emily is, is there current research being done on uncurable diseases in space? If yes, would you share some information? Uh, sure, there are quite a few um, of medical investigations going uh, on board the International Space Station. Uh, a couple of things that we are able to do in microgravity that we simply can't do on Earth is the testing of a lot of pharmaceuticals. So those protein structures, as they grow in our body, uh, we have a hard time duplicating them perfectly on Earth, again, because of gravity. So in space, we can have those uh, protein structures more accurately um, mimicked, and then we can test the pharmaceuticals uh, against those protein structures. Now that it doesn't mean that we have to necessarily develop these pharmaceuticals in space, but maybe we would find um, something that is more effective and then develop it back on planet Earth. There's also a lot of cancer research uh, done. Of course, we can grow cancer cells here on planet, but again, we're able to grow them in a higher quality in space uh, and therefore test uh, our medical investigations at a, at a greater, um, higher fidelity level. All right, here's another question. It says, were you able to bring aspects of your culture with you to space? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, I did take uh, something from my childhood with me. Uh, I took a dream catcher that my mother gave me when I was young. And, you know, when you're a kid, sometimes you have a hard time falling asleep or you, or you have a lot of dreams. And it was it was something that my that my mom gave me and shared with me, you know, some some techniques about uh, dealing with that. And it's just a, a little piece of my life that I took with me to station and it lived actually floated in my room. And I just took a, a piece of Velcro and a string and tied it. There's some ventilation coming through in our little crew quarters. And so it would just float and wave. Uh, it was it was very beautiful and it reminded me of home and of my family and how much love and support there was on the planet. Another question from Little Singer Community School, fifth to sixth grade student question by, um, correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Hushoni. How did your family feel about you going to space? Is it difficult to walk in your spacesuit and does your body get claustrophobic while living in the International Space Station? Um, so my family was, of course, very, very proud and excited. Uh, I think they were, you know, just like all parents, a little worry for your children. So I remember, you know, the first time that I told my parents that I was just selected to be an astronaut. And uh, I think my mother cried uh, half out of joy and half out of terror, maybe, uh, that I'd be leaving the planet on top of a rocket. Uh, but they were very supportive, which I'm, which I'm thankful for. 
um, in your spacesuit, it's uh, it can be quite challenging to move in a spacesuit because it's very large and bulky. Uh, we have different types of spacesuits, whether we are uh, flying in a spacecraft or if we are doing uh, a spacewalk when we go out the door. And those keep your body at, at a good, as safe from the vacuum of space, but also they keep your uh, body cool. You have a series of, of tubes that are running water and you can control the temperature. In fact, I have a glove here. Uh, this is the same type of glove that I wear in space. And you can see it's, it's actually a quite large, you know, relative to my hand. And when you're in space, uh, it's vacuum outside. And so we pressurize the uh, spacesuit to 4.3 PSI. Um, and so that's a pressure differential. And so you're kind of blown up like a balloon. And so there's no pressure here in this glove, but when I'm in space, it's, it's kind of blown up. And so every time I squeeze my hands, I'm working against the pressure of that suit. And the EVAs are, are six to seven hours. And so it can be a, quite a challenging workout, not only for you mentally, but physically as well. And I think that was the last part of your question. Oh, do you get claustrophobic? Um, if you're a person that gets claustrophobic, then yes, you probably would get very claustrophobic uh, in space, in the spacecraft, in your spacesuit. It's a very uh, tight, confined, you know, um, area. However, you know, we do a ton of training at NASA to make sure that you're prepared and that you feel comfortable before you actually launch to space. Another question from a little singer from Alita. What do other planets look like from the International Space Station? And is it cold or hot in space? Um, and so planets look similar to what they look like here on Earth, and they just look like a, a really bright, uh, they look like a bright star. Um, but the difference is, you know, when you're on planet Earth and you look into the into the night sky, you can tell it's a planet because it doesn't doesn't twinkle like a star twinkles. Um, and in, in space, though, nothing twinkles. They all kind of look the same, but there's just so many more of these uh, stars and it is they're so bright it's incredible um, you are inside the space station at a constant temperature of 72 degrees but when you're in the cupola sometimes that changes especially as the sun is coming up the sun is so powerful it's incredible and you can't look at the sun it will damage your it'll damage your eyes right away and if your skin is in the cupola and that sun is coming through the mirror you can get a sunburn in about 20 seconds so as soon as that sun comes up you can see it rising but the second the rays come over the horizon you have to duck into the cupola but sometimes i would stick my hand up and you could feel the warmth of the sun on your hands and you can see the light reflecting off of it it was just incredible to see how powerful the sun is Another question, um, what does it mean to you to be the first Native American woman in space? Uh, it's really, it's really an honor. And it's, um, I think it comes with some responsibility too. I feel like I have a duty to share my journey, to share my journey with the younger generation, with indigenous peoples, um, because I'm sure there's kids out there like I was when I was younger and I didn't realize that I could be an astronaut. I didn't realize that that opportunity was uh, was there and presenting itself and that it was something that if that was what I desired to do, I should go after that. So I feel like if there are children um, that don't realize that they can be a doctor or a scientist or a, or a poet or a, a journalist, whatever it is that they're interested in, it's important that they know that other people have done this in the past, other people that have maybe similar backgrounds to, they, to what they have not only to inspire them, but to also help them realize, you know, like me, I didn't have it all figured out as a kid and, and maybe they don't have it figured out and maybe they live in an area where where they don't have access to the internet, to all of this information. Um, and so it's important that when you have those challenges or those barriers that you reach out to your community, that your community also supports you to help you overcome those challenges. All right, another question was, were there any unexpected or surprising results from the, ex the experiments that you participated in at the International Space Station? Oh, there's so many uh, cool experience that, uh, experiments that we do. Now, a lot of time though, we are collecting data. And so you're working with the principal investigator that's on the ground. 
uh, and maybe that's a company or perhaps it's a university. And so you're collecting all the data and it comes back down uh, to the ground. And oftentimes these experiments will last, um, you know, multiple years they could. Um, and by the time all the data is compiled and then a report is produced. Um, so sometimes you'll do work on some incredible things on the space station, but you won't actually uh, see the results of some of those scientific experiments till you're back or maybe, or maybe years later. Now, some of the experiments that we did or the technology development that you could see really time on board was the Astrobees. So remember those little flying robots that we saw? Uh, the two I mainly worked with were uh, Bumblebee and Queen Bee. And interestingly, it was like these little robots had their own personalities because Bumblebee was very well behaved and Bumblebee would follow the protocol and navigate you know, well in the module with, with whatever experiment we had set up. It felt like Queen Bee, on the other hand, had a little bit of a mind of her own, and sometimes she would leave the module and you would see her floating out into Node 2 where she didn't belong at all, and you'd have to go, go put her back. Uh, but it was interesting because each time you did these experiments, uh, the team on the ground made changes and they learned things. And then you could see the evolution of these little robots as, as they essentially learned through people on the ground and programming to execute the, uh, the test profiles that we gave them. Did you have space legs when you returned to Earth, kind of like sea legs after being on a sea vessel for extended times? Yes, but way worse, way worse. <laughs> so when you, uh, you know, when you live in space for six months, you're, you don't use your vestibular system at all. And so I kind of think of it like it essentially goes to sleep. So when you get back to planet, you have no sense of balance at all. It's not that you necessarily feel, you know, like you were dizzy, like you went around in the merry-go-round really fast. You would just have no sensor up and down and you can't control yourself. And so you saw in the video when they pulled us out of the spacecraft, we were literally lying down. And then they kind of sit us up and set us on a gurney. And as you go to stand up, I remember I just felt like I was continuing to fall forward and I had no control over that. Now, your body adapts to 1G quite rapidly. So, you know, about uh, two hours later, I was able to walk a little bit. And about five hours later, I was able to walk off the airplane when we landed back in Houston. But I was still very wobbly. And you don't quite get all of your agility and balance back. Uh, for me, it took about 30 days. All right. Nevea wants to know, do you play sports? And how, I think it's, how did you water the plants? In the International Space Station. Okay, yes. Uh, so I played sports uh, as a child growing up. I played multiple different sports. And then I think it was about junior high, I settled on soccer. I just loved it. I played indoor soccer and outdoor soccer and soccer for my school and soccer for my, for my club team. Um, and I think that was a really important part uh, for me personally as, as a young child because it taught me to work together on a team. It gave me a great foundation for that teamwork and, and how to deal with the disappointment, you know, when we lost the big tournament and also to how to celebrate uh, with my team those great victories. It also helped me uh, navigate the Naval Academy uh, where I also played soccer. It was a great outlet. So even though it's so important to study hard and to focus on your academics, it's really important that you take care of yourself mentally as well, uh, and that you don't burn yourself out so that you can continue. And soccer for me was a great uh, way to relax and kind of not think about school for a while and get some good energy out. And it was very healthy for me. Um, and I'm saying the second part of your question. Oh, I sorry, I missed it. What was the second part of the question? Um, how did you water the plants? Oh, the plants. Yes. Okay. So as you can imagine, you cannot take your watering can and then just turn it upside down. Um, the water would just stick to the can. And even if you could squirt it out, it would just form a big ball. So what we did is we had a, uh, some tubes that would go into what they call it a pillow. It's like um, a little sponge with a, or like a little pillow, sorry, that has the dirt inside of it and the plants growing out of the pillow. And so we have a tube that injects the water and you can pull a plunger that pulls water from a bag and then you flip a little valve and then you depress the plunger and it puts the water into the little pillow. And because that pillow has the dirt inside of it and the surface tension of the water, the water sticks to the dirt and the plant can drink it. How have the seeds you harvested and brought back from Earth changed? 
So I have not seen, that's one result of an experiment that I have not seen yet. Um, and I'm not sure that they're, they're complete with that investigation, but we harvested the seeds and sent them down. So the next experiment that goes up will have uh, seeds from planet Earth, seeds that were from the space station, and they can grow those plants in the same conditions and see what that epigenetic changes are uh, between those two plants. Ooh, this is a good one. Um, could you talk about the experience of taking off from Earth and returning to Earth, both what it was like physically and emotionally? Absolutely, yes. So, um, you know, people often ask, was I nervous when we were getting ready to launch the space? And I wasn't nervous. Um, I certainly, my heart was pounding. And I was, uh, you know, thinking about everything I needed to do. I was very focused but I wasn't nervous or scared. And I think that's because I was prepared. You know, when you strap yourself into a roller coaster, for example, you're nervous because you're not sure really what's gonna happen. It's the unexpected. Um, but in this case, there are teams of people that train us and prepare us for exactly what it's going to be like on launch day. Um, and it's very similar. So sitting on top of the rocket, all the communications, all the procedures of getting strapped in, of getting the spacecraft ready to go, those are all similar. Uh, we even flew the uh, G profile, which is the amount of force that you feel on your body in a centrifuge back here on Earth. And so the G forces when you launch, because we're laying on our back, the G forces come straight through your chest. So here on Earth, we feel one G, one times the force of gravity. On launch, though, the G profile builds up to four and a half Gs for about six minutes. So it's a sustained amount of Gs that are coming through uh, your chest. And you can feel the power of the rocket and the shaking as you go uphill. It feels like a huge elephant is kind of sitting on your chest and you really have to intentionally breathe uh, to work against that pressure. You know, an interesting thing, too, is that your tongue weighs four and a half times what it would be on Earth when you're at four and a half Gs. And so it falls into the back of your throat. And it kind of gives you this like choking feeling a little bit. So you realize, oh, no, it's just my tongue. Everything's OK. So that's a little something that you have to get used to. Uh, coming back home is the same thing instead of acceleration. Now we are feeling deceleration as we come back through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, prior to entry, we're traveling at Mach 25, so 25 times the speed of sound. And as our spacecraft slams into the atmosphere, we decelerate. And so again, you're feeling Gs building up, about four and a half Gs that are coming through your chest. Uh, but this time, you are literally a ball of fire coming back through the atmosphere. And we have some windows that are down by our feet and are able to, I was able to lift my hat up. I look out those windows and you could see the sparks of, you know, yellow and white kind of colors. And then as we got faster, or actually, sorry, as we slowed down and the temperature is built, you see this plasma and it's just this orange that just covers the window. Uh, and it's amazing until you get through uh, slow enough that we can deploy parachutes um, and then we land in the water. And when you actually touch down in the water, it's a pretty it's a pretty smooth touchdown. Like you can tell I definitely hit the water, but it's not this big jarring um, type of a landing. Can you describe the emotions you felt the first time you viewed our planet from the ISS? Why do you yeah. think the perspective is important for us back home to think about and understand? I wish I could describe that feeling. I just, it's just an overwhelming experience. It really is. I talked about, you know, in that video, you could see how beautiful the planet was. And you can see this photo of planet Earth behind me. Um, it was really incredible to see the lights, to see the colors, to see the cloud formations, to see the water, and to see how alive our planet is. And then it was also amazing then to look out into the vacuum of space and some of the darkest dark emptiness you've ever seen in your entire life. And so I talk about those two emotions, right? This majesty and this awe and this beauty of our planet. And then the vacuum of space and just realize, oh my goodness, we are this tiny little precious marble in the vacuum of space. And how important it is you know, that we recognize that and take care of our planet. And as you pass over those continents in just a matter of minutes, you don't see any borders. You see no barriers, no battle lines. You don't see the world as independent countries or independent states or independent communities. You see the world as one. And you see all people on that world as humans. And it gives you, even though I was far away, I thought maybe I would feel isolated. 
I didn't. I felt this very strong connection with the energy of the people back on Earth, but and all people back on Earth. All right, here's a question from Anne Over. What new recommendations do you have for Artemis and Orion, given you were part of that program before? Yes, yes. So I worked uh, the um, exploration and Orion program um, for a long time before moving over to commercial crew and the space station. And we are still learning a lot of things. So uh, fortunately in the astronaut office, we are all involved in the test and development of the new spacecraft. And so sometimes that would be um, you're in the spacecraft, you're in a suit, and you're looking at developing the new emergency procedures should something go wrong and you need to get out of the spacecraft. What's the best way to do that? What's the correct order to do that? And what's the proper terminology that we want to use to execute that mission? Uh, a lot of what we look at it too is human factors. How do you interact with the displays in the spacecraft? And or is the information that's being displayed to you is it not only readable, but is it intuitive? And then if I need to select something, am I able to do that? Or is it confusing and, and, and I'm going to make an error, right? That's the last thing that you want to do. And so how that information is presented and, and how we interact, how does this switch feel? What kind of a feedback do I need? Do I need to you know, increase the force on this switch? Or is this a switch that has little force and it's easily to be bumped? So now we need to put some type of a shield or a guard on, on that. Uh, most recently, I was part of some testing out at SpaceX for HLS, which is the human lander system. This will be a Starship, the first um, lander on the moon. And we were looking at, we we're wearing um, not actual spacesuits because they're too heavy, but a volumetric mock-up of what a spacesuit is. And we were doing just that, looking at the different types of controls. And I, when I'm wearing this huge glove and there's a little tiny switch, am I able to reach that switch or does my, my big thumb kind of get in the way and accidentally hit another switch? Um, do I have feedback and understanding of that switch and what it's telling me to do? And then there is a, a type of a ramp structure that comes down. Am I easily able to deploy that ramp and pull it back in? Can I do it by myself? Do I need help? Do we need some type of a tether or an aid? So it's really fun to be involved, especially early on, in some of that testing and development. Another question from Little Singer. Um, can you watch TV in space or call people? Yes, you actually, you absolutely can. And so NASA will send up uh, TV shows, whatever you'd like to watch or sporting events like recorded so you can watch them on your own time. If we have a big event, for instance, uh, we had the Super Bowl uh, while I was on board, then they can actually stream that real time up to the space station so you have a chance to watch some of those sporting events together with your crew. Uh, we use a series of satellites um, and we have a KU band, and as long as you have that coverage, then you can call from your computer home down to anybody black here on planet Earth. And actually a new technology that we were just uh, testing when I was on board and is now used quite often, it's called a DoxyMe, and it is a, um, it's like a video teleconferencing system. And so just on your iPad, uh, somebody else can be on their computer or their iPad on Earth, and you could do um, a video teleconference with that person, and you can even give them a tour of the International Space Station. All right, here's a question from Ed. He said, you mentioned the spacecraft is like a ball of fire during reentry. Is the outside of the spacecraft hot when you land in the water? If so, is there a steam or hissing sound when you land? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, it gets extremely hot. Um, we have a heat shield, of course, on the uh, part of the spacecraft that hits the atmosphere as we're coming through. And that heat shield is what protects us from those extreme temperatures uh, when you're coming through. You can hear, um, as you enter Earth's atmosphere, you can hear uh, the atmosphere going by and, and it rumbles. Um, but you don't have enough of a, of a fine hearing to know if, if it makes a, like a hiss or anything like that when it hits the ground. Um, I don't know about the steam. That's a really good question. We landed at night and so um, we don't have any cameras that were really close to us. At that time, the uh, SpaceX uh, rescue crews are on boats and they're a safe distance away from our spacecraft. Uh, and they have lights and night vision goggles. So once we land and the chutes are cut and out of the way, then they come in on boats and jet skis, uh, but they're not, um, they weren't close enough to have footage. Uh, but I would imagine 
that there, were, there would be some type of, of steam released when you, when you hit the ocean. I'm going to ask about that. It's a really good one. What was your favorite experience in space? What did you do on your downtime? Mm, I don't know that I could pick a, a one favorite experience, you know. I think that, uh, you know, especially having the opportunity to do two spacewalks, that was absolutely incredible. It's something that you trained for. We trained for here on Earth in this huge pool called a neutral buoyancy lab. And it is 40 feet deep. And they put us in a spacesuit, blow us up like a balloon to that 4.3 PSID now because we're here on planet Earth. And then there's a team of divers that work together to try to make you neutrally buoyant. And we have a life-size mock-up of the International Space Station, uh, minus the solar arrays inside this pool. And everything is mocked up just exactly. Every handrail, every cable. And so you'll spend six hours underneath the water practicing these spacewalks. And, and over the course of years, you have hundreds and hundreds of hours of training. Uh, and so it's really a privilege to actually go out the door and put a lot of that training to work. Um, you know, in my downtime, I really enjoyed calling home to my friends and my family. And sometimes I enjoy just going to the cupola and looking out the window and watching our beautiful planet go by. All right, we get a couple more questions here. These two are both kind of related. So somebody wanted to know what time zone um, is, are you in at the International Space Station? And do you get jet lagged while traveling in and out of space? Right, that's a good question. So we all need to be synced up. So we use Zulu time, which is the same as Greenwich uh, Mean Witch time. So uh, GMT. Okay, I think we're getting towards the end of the questions. Um, we can pass it back to you, Nancy, if you're ready. Okay. Oh my gosh, thank you. Let's see. Good, I'm un unmuted. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was just, it was so exciting to see you in person and um, and and hear your beautiful presentation and answering the questions. And I've been looking at some of the um, comments that came in and um, I wish I could find this one to read to you because it was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I don't know if you've gotten a chance to look at them. And Chris, I I I guess we can we have these um, recorded. Yes, an, we do. Anyway, an eighty-one-year-old woman just wrote in. This is what she wrote. Her name is Evelyn Below. Best Zoom ever. Thank you from this eighty-year-old who is so impressed with all the wonderful options there are for females now. So I thought that was great because we've heard. Thank from you, Evelyn. I appreciate that. <laughs> Lots of wonderful comments. Um, what excites me is there's quite a few of um, we know of quite a few school uh, classrooms that had their whole their whole um, um, all their students come into this presentation. I know little singer. Oh, that's wonderful. Very well represented, and they're doing a lot of stuff with robotics now. And we we work with them through some of our work with the missions. So it's very exciting what kind of um, opportunities are coming around to Native students that wouldn't normally get this kind of um, a support and how excited they are about, you know, your trajectory and everything. Um, I want to turn the mic over to Daniela now. We have um, something we'd like to give you with tremendous gratitude for what you've contributed today. Daniela? Commander Mann, thank you so much for sharing of yourself today with all of us. And we have a gift for you. Um, that oh, we that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my it, goodness. It really is. And I, I know the video isn't doing it justice, so I can't wait for it to be in your hands and around around your neck, hopefully wearing it proudly. Um, this was a gift made for you by Clara May Armajo and Nadia Armajo from the Navajo Nation. So oh we my goodness. To present Thank this you. To that means so much to me. It's beautiful. Good, good. We'll coordinate with you afterward to make sure you. Can. Okay. Yeah. And they're, by the way, they're my grandkids and they're beautiful. They're carrying on the tradition of beautiful beadwork. So they're obviously very talented. <laughs> um, okay. Well, this has been a wonderful presentation. I do want to say that we have been recording this presentation. Every one of you um, that is 
on, or you can tell your friends, you can go to our website for the Indigenous Education Institute, which is www.indigenouseducation.org. And Chris has been posting that um, all along. So you can download the whole thing in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, it's free. You can play it back. Um, we know a lot of universities are using this series as a um, curriculum. So lots of these are going directly into college classrooms and all the way down to um, K through 12. So um, it, it gets a wide, um, uh, people continue to see this as we go on in time. Um, let me see. I think I, think, um, I want to say in closing, I want to and I want to extend a very special thank you to our technical support, Chris Terran from Terran Solutions. He's the one you see in the bubble, the three th <laughs> off to the, and there's some of his beautiful um, um, Aurora photos, and I'm sure he was excited to see the one you showed from space. Um, He's from uh, Friday Harbor, Washington. Each time we host one of these speakers, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. The coyote factor is a big one. That's a Navajo disruptor and bringer of chaos. And it's always lurking somewhere. And Chris is the one who always comes up with a plan B or plan C to counter the possible chaos. Um, and also a shout out I want to give to Chanel um, for creating the beautiful poster that advertised this. Um, thank you so much, Chanel. You did just a, such a splendid job. Thank you to both you and Caitlin for your really wonderful handling of question and answer. I think you should be our permanent um, question and answer person, for sons. Um, we'll be sending out an email to you just after this presentation with a short survey to ask your reaction to what you've heard today. Please take time to answer the questions. We want to make the series meaningful to all of you. And one of the ways we can do it is to get your responses to, to the different webinars. And I think today's was such an incredible presentation. Um, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, um, Nicole, for coming on and spending the time with us. And you know, it's just like throwing a pebble into a stream. You never know who's out there that is going to be deeply touched by what they've heard today. And um, we can't even imagine, but um, a lot of kids saw it, a lot of people that we've been talking to. And so um, I guess I'll close this by saying, and unless you wanted to have a final word, Nicole. Oh, just thank you so much. It was truly a privilege to uh, to share my journey with you and I your speaker series. Um, and I think this is it's so important and you're doing a wonderful job. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. You're very welcome. So I will say Wado in Cherokee. I will say Ahiehe in Navajo. And thank you all for being with us today on this extraordinary um, morning. <laughs>